Hello, everyone. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in healthcare IT. And today we actually have a special panel of experts on, on AI and uh, working on the problem of sepsis, which is one of the biggest problems in healthcare. And we're going to go ahead and uh, let them introduce themselves. So we'll kind of go around the room. Uh, Nikki, do you want to start? Absolutely. Uh, hi, John. Thank you for uh, having me in your show. I'm a fan. Uh, I'm a data scientist, uh, life sciences professional, working uh, closely with customers as well with product uh, in the healthcare side of the house at H2O.ai. Uh, my, my background is uh, both in life sciences, technology for biological solutions, as well as have experience uh, with population health solutions, as well as cl clinical decision support tools. It's a pleasure to be here again. Thank you. Yeah, good to have you here. And next up, Prashant. Thanks, John. Uh, delighted to be back on the show. Thanks for having us. And more importantly, our customer, uh, Lubomir, uh, who's doing some great work. My name is Prashant Natarajan. I'm a vice president of product and strategy at H2O.ai, specifically focused on health insurers, providers, and life sciences. I am also uh, a co-faculty instructor at Stanford University School of Medicine and a distinguished fellow at the Health Innovation Alliance. Um, I, my biggest claim to fame is I have been a contributor to healthcare IT today in the past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you're you're uh, overselling it, but uh, you know it's funny. You didn't even mention that you've literally written the books on uh, on healthcare machine learning and AI, so people can check that out as well. <laughs> thank you, thank you, John. Uh, demystifying big data and machine learning for healthcare has been the runaway bestseller for the last four years, uh, yeah. thanks to reviews by you and others. Um, and then multidisciplinary approach to head and neck cancer looks at how to bring together precision medicine and population health together in one package. And there's a new book coming out later this year, shameless plug now, demystifying AI for the enterprise with a bunch of leaders and some powerful healthcare case studies that yeah. H2O has been working on. Looking forward to it. Great to have you here. And uh, last but not least, uh, Lubomir, will you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Lubomir Buturovic. Very delighted to be here. And uh, my job is uh, VP of Machine Learning at Inflamatics. Uh, my responsibility is developing machine learning models for uh, clinical diagnostics, specifically for infectious diseases. I've been working in this uh, area for, I think it's about 18 years now. It's great to have you. Well, I'm excited to talk about this because everyone likes to talk about machine learning and AI. I mean, I think we've been working on the problem of sepsis for a long time and trying to apply data to that problem. But, you know, maybe you can start us off, Prashant. What are some of the issues with today's approaches to AI and sepsis prediction? Yeah, well, I'll start with a very high level meta view because you know me, John. That's kind of, we can drill yeah. into other details as we want. Sounds good. I think there are about two or three primary challenges. The state of the art, uh, for example, on what we are doing with genetic algorithms and complex ensembles, explainability, and so on and so forth. These have to be a part of the AI ML data science process, soup to nuts. And the challenges of just doing one and not everything else in the pipeline that leads to success uh, will basically create a lack of trust it'll create a lack of confidence. And those things, as you know, are bigger challenges to making a solution work at scale and actually work, right? So I think uh, that's one of the things. The other challenge we have is one of essentially operationalization. The scoring pipelines we build, the models we build, the AI apps we build, they should lead to quicker context sensitive adoption of the AI, which essentially this year is a prime example of because people don't have the time to look at models in isolation or uh, reducing that gap between the, the folks who are technical and the folks who are actually business clinical users is very important. And looking at ways to do that, to operationalize things also makes the other thing easier, which is change management. 
So I would say that for the industry as a whole, I think these still remain the top three challenges from my perspective. And what we are doing is focusing on essentially having an end-to-end approach that addresses not just the technical aspects also, but also the soft aspects of it, which needs to greater adoption. Yeah. Anything else you'd add to this, Nikki? Yeah, I think uh, that uh, Prashant, of course, is uh, spot on on uh, bringing together all the separate solutions that currently exist, uh, creating a workflow, uh, starting from uh, creation uh, of, of, of a model, an accurate model, uh, a performant model. Uh, especially in healthcare, we need to pay a, a big emphasis on, on explainability methods. This is something that we're doing. This is something that I'm hoping we'll, we'll have the uh, time to discuss uh, more with Lubomir and what Inflamatics has done. Uh, and then being able to monitor the model because there is something as uh, human uh, variability coming from a biology background. So the more uh, people who actually see the model, the more people who, who use the model, we will need to be able to, not, to monitor the performance and adjust course as we move. And these, these are all things that we are uh, touching upon in our solutions. Yeah. So Lubmir, what would you add to this? And, and maybe let's extend the conversation a little bit and talk about, you know, how are you seeing AI and machine learning evolving to be able to more accurately address sepsis? So I would uh, add from uh, my perspective at a somewhat high level, there are two key directions in diagnosing uh, sepsis. And one is using electronic health, health records data, and the other is using genomic data, literally measuring genes in the patient's blood. So uh, I'll just say I'm not an expert on EHR, but just empirically speaking, I note that that direction hasn't been particularly successful to date, even though it has some number of years of history. In, and there was this recent kind of, uh, I'm not sure if you would call it controversy, but at least uh, 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 writings about the EPIC uh, and their application of EHR for sepsis diagnosis. I think the fair statement is, would be to say that direction hasn't lived up to expectations uh, up to this point. The yeah. other direction which we are pursuing at Inflamatics is uh, genomically based. And it's, as I said, based on machine learning analysis of uh, genomic expression data. This is basically levels of genes in the uh, patient's uh, blood. And this is more recent approach. It is, uh, has been uh, validated to a significant degree in academic literature. And it is almost literally as we speak in the process of being translated into clinical uh, care. Whether that will be successful, we surely expect because otherwise we wouldn't be pursuing it. Uh, but it is not uh, yet widely on the market because it's more recent and it's just uh, coming to uh, technical realization. So that's yeah. My... So let's dive into that a little bit and you know talk about how your approach is different than the EHRs have approached sepsis, which is largely from either EHR data or claims data to try to you know predict the sepsis uh, you know issues in their organization. So. How is Inflamatics, you know, using a more of a diagnostic approach to identifying sepsis? What, what's involved? What do you need? Uh, maybe give us an uh, overview of how it works. So the overall workflow is relatively simple conceptually. Uh, we take a blood sample from patient and for our first product, which is emergency department, uh, uh, we, we take a venic puncture and uh, uh, extract white blood cells and uh, measure gene expression, which is the abundance of individual genes in, the, in, the, in those cells using a custom de designed and developed instrument. 
uh, which we are uh, working on right now. And this process generates basically vectors of measurements, which are feature vectors, which then uh, enter a signal processing and machine learning pipeline, which runs on this instrument itself. So this process generates a user-friendly test report, which indicates the likelihood that bacterial infection, viral infection, or absence of infection altogether, which is quite plausible uh, because their symptoms overlap significantly. So that's the overall workflow. Uh, my particular job is analyzing the gene expression data using machine learning and developing uh, the classifiers in essence, which de deliver the test reports to patients and uh, their caregivers uh, using machine learning. Yeah, so let's talk about that, Nikki, because, uh, you know, that sounds like a very diagnostic solution to me. So what is the role of AI and machine learning in this process? I, I think, I mean, the AI is essential. Uh, the model is built uh, uh, using uh, machine learning tools as opposed to what is until now been used with genetic data, which is more statistical comparative analysis, where uh, it's actually restricted to the specific population that uh, you sampled from. Uh, what machine learning uh, by definition does, it can extrapolate from the existing knowledge, from the data for which uh, the model was trained to, to a broader population to create, uh, to, to find the commonalities first and then create the model to actually put these commonalities in production in this diagnostic use. What I would like to add and uh, I have actually yeah. had the privilege to be working uh, with Lubomir and the team uh, as uh, relatively regularly, I, I would I would say, and uh, uh, observe their process closely. Is that uh, it is a very robust uh, development method they have uh, they have applied. Uh, at the same time, they are taking pretty much the two. For me, biggest technological revelations of the last 10, 20 years, which is uh, the technology behind molecular biology and automation, robotics. And of course, this is something that uh, I don't know exactly the details, but I do know that uh, only 20 years ago, in order to be running a genetic test like that, you needed to spend two or three hours in the lab. Just the fact uh, two or three days, I'm sorry, in the lab. Now what they're having, they're having this machine automation together with the, all this know-how in the biology tech side, which has been a huge revolution. And they're bringing it together uh, with machine learning, which is the other big revolution in computer science. Uh, so I, I, I really am very excited about the solution. I think it goes beyond uh, what we are who have come to, uh, to expect in terms of diagnostics and really gives an excellent example of how molecular data, genetic data can be used in lo on location for, for this type of analysis. And of course, sepsis is a big, big uh, problem in the ICU, so they're offering a meaningful solution at the same time. Well, it seems like timing is the issue, right? I mean, with sepsis, we always hear about that, you know, and when you tell me lab and you tell me genomics, I think slow. So like, how fast is this? Uh, you know, I don't know, Nikki, if you know, you know, like you talked about two to three days, where are we at now? Or maybe Lubinier could add as well. So I can uh, follow up on this because I think it's a great segue uh, to what Nikki was saying. And timing is indeed a critical uh attribute of this yeah. uh, problem. Uh, we do have uh, technology today which could uh, deliver this type of results within say you know, 16 hours give or take. But in an emergency department that is clearly not a viable uh, option. So uh, to give you an idea our product is designed to deliver results within 30 minutes of wow. sample being taken. We are in the future targeting I don't know, maybe 15 to 20. There would be, I mean, ideally you would want it instantaneously, but within reason, 
that these are the uh, kind of uh, time frame which makes sense in our target application. And uh, I just want to add that this is what imposes significant challenges to machine learning uh, in, in this context because it limits uh, the number of genes which can be processed in this amount of time. It also uh, uh, has impact on how accurately the gene abundance can be measured in that uh, time span. It, it also uh, impacts, uh, uh, th this has to be uh, done by uh, relatively non-expert personnel. I mean, non-expert for uh, lab, the experts for uh, patient care. Uh, and that also uh, impacts uh, how many genes we can measure uh, in, and how accurately. So this means that the problem is uh, has pretty high uh, uh, noise and this clearly uh, imposes additional challenges for machine learning component. So it's interesting you mentioned the time for the machine learning to do the understanding. Is, did I understand that right? Is, and so when you only have 30 minutes, the machine learning doesn't have time to do the process the results? No, no, that, that's maybe I uh, wasn't clear enough. The machine learning itself, once in a prediction mode, is very fast. Uh, okay. The problem is measuring the gene abundance. Uh, that is okay. what takes the bulk of the time. Uh, uh, in these 30 minutes. And not only does it take most of the time, it also limits how many genes can be measured and uh, how accurately, which in turn impacts how uh, accurately you can train your models. That, yeah. That's the, so, that so for perception. machine learning, it translates into challenges with model training. Yeah, definitely. Prashan, is this where the future is? you know, is kind of combining the molecular with, you know, and maybe other sources of data, including the HR that we kind of hammered a little at the beginning, but you know, <laughs> is, is that the future, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, combining that data to be able to produce some actionable results? Yeah. So John, you know, I will give you the most colorful take on any question, right? So I would say it has been the future for the last 30 years but we have not been able to realize it for a few reasons. We didn't have the technologies that are currently available, like what uh, our teams are doing together here was not possible, right? With the combination of rapid improvements in capabilities of algorithms, coupled with the ability to do various things to manage the MLOps life cycle of putting then these things into production, and then being able to create high value outsets. And how do we define high value outsets? It has to have a patient value. It should have provider value. It should also have a business value or clinical value or mission value if you're a not-for-profit uh, health system, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the question is how fast can we get to the future, right? And the two aspects over there, John, which I think uh, our other two guests also touched upon is accuracy, uh, explainability, transparency, fairness, and also then technically the able to do, ability to deliver this at scale, right? That is what is going to cause the success. So the future is going to be determined by how successful we are on multiple efforts like this, because that success will breed more success. Doing it the wrong way can still be done, but it also leads to these things about, well, are we sh really sure it works? Identify the right problem as uh, uh, Leo Vermeer and Nikki did and work on it together. You can uh, basically get rapid results that pass those important criteria in a healthcare context. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you talk about you know, how do we build the trust and how do we make sure that this is a success so we can build it into the future? And Lubomir, you, you mentioned earlier that you've done some research, you know, around this. So can you let us know what's some of the research that you've done on, on this test and what efficacy are you seeing? Uh, so 
I mean, we, we have published a fair number of uh, peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts on uh, different applications of our technology. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, to go over those would be a uh, <laughs> I don't think couple hours. Today. Uh, <laughs> What's yeah, the Cliff Notes version? <laughs> but, but, but the gist is that uh, we, we believe we have uh, uh, tests and algorithms which deliver uh, clinical value to uh, patients and uh, caregivers in the infectious disease space. Uh, at this point, we are focused on emergency department, but also beyond that. And I think that our uh, publications uh, demonstrate that in a scientifically rigorous manner. That said, the ultimate uh, uh, clinical evidence is uh, running what's called pivotal trials, mm -hmm. which are clinical trials which uh, demonstrate the value of our technology and anybody else's. Everybody is in the same boat who works in this space in independent uh, data, which then uh, goes to uh, publication in uh, respectable uh, journals. And uh, also in this particular space, uh, the because this goes to hospitals, you have to go through FDA clearance in order to sell the uh, products in United States or equivalent procedure in other uh, countries or regions, uh, which puts additional, at least safety valve on what we uh, deliver to clinical care. So I, I think that's ultimately what the uh, consumers of our products, the clinicians uh, and their patients are looking to, to have confidence in uh, what we are delivering. Absolutely. We all want the peer-reviewed studies. I, I think that's the fear of many that are doing machine learning. They don't want to go to that time factor of doing those, doing the clinical trials. So it's great that you've been published that way. Anything uh, you'd add, uh, no, uh, Prashant, go ahead. Not, not to do a plug on H2O, but we also, not only with our customer success stories like this, um, but also other types of healthcare organizations, John. In addition to that, we do quite a bit of healthcare specific research and development in healthcare AI. So for example, uh, folks like Nikki here and others on the team kind of bring both the domain expertise and deep data science chops to the table to deal with the various opportunities around structured data uh, both phenotypic data and multi-omics data. Looking at keeping AI ML relevant to applications such as cytopathology, uh, which Nikki has been in the forefront of, in terms of looking at what is happening around liquid biopsies and some of the things. It's not just about solving issues we know exist. It's also pushing the boundaries of science with data-driven approaches of which today's AI ML certainly is to drive the science as well. So we also do quite a bit of publishing at our end. Um, so, so that's one of the things, right? Because evidence is what drives change. You did ask a question earlier. You said, do you see the combining of phenotypic and omics data that is the future of healthcare AI? Uh, absolutely, yes. I've always said, and I've written before John, as you know, that precision medicine and population health are two sides of the same coin. We cannot just have a precision medicine that only works for people who have a certain cutoff on social determinants, including income, right? At the same time, being able to learn from precision medicine and applying it to pop health and vice versa. And the work that Lubumin is doing, which is if you traditionally look at the applications of omics, traditionally over the last 30 years, it has primarily been driven by cancer in certain cases, chronic diseases. But what Lubomir and his team are doing is bringing that together in the ED side of the house where there's clinical impact, there's financial impact, there's operational impact, right? There's engagement impact. And that's what I think makes it truly unique. Yeah, definitely.
and it saves lives. But I think that to your point, though, I think the challenge is how do we know that we trust the AI or the machine learning that's being done? Uh, uh, Nikki, I don't know if you want to chime in around, you know, how do we trust it? Especially, you know, it's great to have it published. It's great to do a clinical study, but it moves so quickly, right? <laughs> like it moves so much quicker than our publishing apparatus. So how do we know that we can trust the AI, Nikki? What I think moves very quickly is the technology to achieve that first big uh, stepping stone, which is accuracy of the model. And that goes hand in hand uh, with availability of data. And since the discussion today is about genomics data, this is something that uh, there is scarcity of for these big scale uh, efforts that Prashan just touched upon, that even touch about uh, on population health combining with EHR. However, this is now starting to change. We already have seen a big uh, effort uh, in the UK, an analogous effort here uh, in the US uh, from government institutions to collect these big, uh, genet big, big numbers of genetic data here in the US. It's called All of Us. It's an initiative by NIH. Uh, where the goal is uh, to have 1 million uh, diverse individuals representative of the American, American population sequenced, both in the genomic le level, also as well as the expression level that Lyubomir mentioned. These are two coins, uh, two sides of the same coin when we're talking about uh, this technology. Now, when we're talking about trust, I think the first big step is uh, actually identifying the need First of all, identifying the need to have a varied population. There is variation within humans, even uh, people of the same family, they will have differences. Understand how this, uh, if this, first of all, if this has a possibility to affect the model based and again now understanding how the model works. These are very hard, uh, uh, not hard, but uh, more, more, more technological tools we have, understanding uh, how the model is working. And this is something we're also putting a lot of emphasis here in H2O. And uh, once you have that also, another level of explainability is uh, to be able to create uh, this uh, understanding of the model, for example, for the more technical uh, people in the audience, uh, in terms of uh, features, uh, features contributing to the outcome, uh, surprisingly, perhaps uh, the same feature might have, like or gene, might have might play positive or negative roles for different individuals depending on the surrounding genetic environment. We now have the tools to understand that, and even. Uh, cross-reference with the literature because there is also the the slow tech. Uh, <laughs> science part of, of, of the knowledge base that we already have. And personally, I don't see a reason why we would want to ignore that. And we have the tools to actually combine these two sides of the same coin together. Yeah, great description. Lubomir, anything you'd add as far as uh, making sure we can trust the results? Because if the doctors and patients don't trust it, you know, <laughs> you have nothing, right? So any other thoughts on, on, on that trust element using AI? Uh, you know, uh, ultimately, we, we have to demonstrate that these uh, technologies improve patient care. That's the uh, ultimate level of evidence. Uh, that uh, people expect to see. And it, it cannot happen on day one because it's uh, basically time consuming and expensive. But gradually you uh, combine different levels of evidence until you eventually achieve adoption. If the, uh, you know, uh, if you, uh, deliver sufficient degree of uh, proof that there is a benefit in using uh, those types of products. Yeah. I think that's the ultimate. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I love it. Uh, this is a fascinating look at, at some of the challenges we face with sepsis. And I, I think the thing that stands out to me is, is, the, is how much quicker we can do this today 
uh, to Brashan's point earlier, uh, you know, five years ago, this wasn't even available, <laughs> or at least it was nascent technology. Uh, now it's just here where we can actually do this type of analysis, both molecular and the data side quickly. So this has been a fascinating uh, a look at where, where this is all headed using uh, AI and machine learning to address sepsis and, and actually the maturity of that approach as well. Uh, Prashant, maybe uh, you could wrap us up. Uh, where can people learn more about H2O AI and, and also your work with informatics and you know, give them an idea of how H2O, H2O AI could, could help their, uh, you know, other organizations that have these problems? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, one of the things is obviously they need to listen more to your show because <laughs> then they can see more of us and they can see more of leaders like Lyubomir bring value to what in areas that are desperately needed. So that's recommendation number one. Recommendation number two is please visit us at h2o.ai. It's easy. Um, and uh, we are kind of I would say we take our mission of educating people, uh, not just customers and our own teams, but the world in general on it's time for us to use AI to do AI. And that's the focus, right? Okay. So that's something that uh, we, we focus a lot on community, John, as a company, given that we probably outsourced more AI ML to get this whole thing started than anybody else or as much as anybody else. So we take that mission of community very seriously. Please join us. And we'll also send you some information, John, that you can add to the website. For example, on our book on interpretability and explainability, right? Going back to your question and going back to Lubomir's point about how do we influence practice and how do we improve care, right? It's all comes down to balancing accuracy and explainability. So we have some links which we can share that you can freely share with your audience. Um, and I would like to thank, of course, uh, Lyubomir and Nikki, uh, because they both have set the standard together in terms of how such a project can go from concept to product to lasting success. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you all sharing your story and looking forward to following along with this. And uh, we'll definitely link to those resources in the article and you can check that out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks so much for taking part. And uh, if, if you have any more questions, uh, be sure to check us out on, on uh, Twitter at the hashtag HITSM and also at HCIT Today. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.